you have a suggestion for a rock star impact podcast guest go to impactpodcast.com and just click be a guest to recommend someone today this edition of the impact podcast is brought to you by eri eri has a mission to protect people the planet and your privacy and is the largest fully integrated it and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity focused hardware destruction company in the United States and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Closed Loop Partners. Closed Loop Partners is a leading circular economy investor in the United States with an extensive network of Fortune 500 corporate investors, family offices, institutional investors, industry experts, and impact partners. Closed Loop's platform spans the arc of capital from venture capital to private equity, bridging gaps, and fostering synergies to scale the circular economy. To find Closed Loop Partners, please go to www.closedlooppartners.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigeri, and I'm so honored to have with us today, Margaret Egan. She's the Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary and World of Care Executive Sponsor at Hyatt Hotels Corporation. Welcome, Margaret, to the Impact Podcast. Hey, John. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Well, you know, before we get talking about all the great and important work that you and your colleagues are doing at Hyatt Hotels, I'd love you first to share a little bit about the Margaret Egan story. Where did you grow up and how did you get on this journey, Margaret? All right, I will. Um, well, let me again say thank you for being here because this is fun. This is fun to have an opportunity to talk about things that we both are really passionate about. Uh, and I love love the chance to speak for my colleagues. There are 200,000 people around the world doing great work at, uh, for, for, um, for Hyatt and to support World of Care. So for me, this is just like, I'm just the spokesperson, but I'm I'm super happy to be here doing it. Uh, so thank you. So my background, uh, I live in Chicago. That's where uh, Hyatt's corporate headquarters are, have been since its inception. And uh, I live with my family, including two children, one who's in college, one who's in high school. So times are interesting and challenging and uh, actually super exciting right now with them. I uh, lived in Chicago for most of my professional life. I grew up in New York, though. I think not far from you. Uh, I grew up on Long Island. You're, really? a queen, you're from Queens, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I remember hearing that. So I grew up the youngest of 10 children in oh. uh, Long Island. Right. I mean, they don't make families that size anymore. What, what town did you grow up in over there? What town? Amityville. Okay, great. Love yeah, on the, on the southern coast of Long Island. So yeah. I uh, grew up big family, you know, in, in a big family, you learn pretty fast that the story is really not about you. You know, you're part of a larger narrative. So, uh, but very, just a, you know, really wonderful background for me. Uh, went to school in the Midwest and ended up in Chicago and then uh, eventually found my way to law school. And I had always known I wanted to be a lawyer. I, I guess I was one of those sort of uh, nerdy kids who just knew that that's what I wanted to do. But in my mind, that meant I was going to be a trial lawyer in court all the time and, you know, very glamorous. Uh, and so that's what I did. I went to law school and I worked in private practice at a firm that I really enjoyed here in Chicago. And I was a commercial litigator and uh, did that for some time. And then my husband and I moved to uh, the UK. So I had a chance to work in London and mm -hmm. spent a couple, not quite no, a little about a year and a half at the American Embassy. They have a with the Department of Justice. They have a small office, or at least did then, at the American Embassy. So it was great. Uh, and you know, I I do love travel. So living in London as a launching point for travel for you know a couple of years was an amazing opportunity. And then we came back to Chicago, and um, I just lucked out. You know, there was there was a position open at Hyatt. And I was thinking about, you know, a changing career, a uh, different path anyway, still law, but, you know, a different path. And so I joined Hyatt and that was 20 years ago. And so I came in from my background of litigation to support litigation and operations. 
And then, you know, things change, opportunities pop up. And uh, over time, I moved from litigation to having absolutely nothing to do with litigation, which uh, was was a surprise. And then moving into transactional work. So I oversaw our transactional team at Hyatt for a number of years. And then uh, finally had an opportunity for the general counsel position, which I've been in for six years. Uh, mm-hmm. Best job ever. Uh, I love it, love it, love it. Uh, I, it's every day, even the hard days are good days, is the way I put it. Um, it's great mm-hmm. work. And the last piece is, you know, re- being a part of World of Care, being the executive sponsor for that, really is the added element to the work that I do that just brings me so much joy uh, and and um, pride, really. Pride, again, in, in the work that our colleagues are doing. So that's the, yeah. I don't know if that's the long answer to your question or the short that's one, right. but that's the Margaret Egan story. Out of the <laughs> 10, were you the youngest, oldest, or in between? I was the youngest, which I think is, um, I mean, you could go on about like whether that's good or bad, right, right. but uh, yeah, it was, it was, I was loosely supervised. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, let's just say your parents were a little tired after nine. I mean, they, they you got to cut right. them a little break. I mean, you know, That's uh, right. I knew the rules and you know how to manage them. And that was that, but uh, yeah, you no, know, five girls and five boys, a really wonderful way to grow up. That's wonderful. Were there any, um, were there already any lawyers in your family that inspired nope. you to become a lawyer? So you were the first. No, uh, actually, well, one of my grandparents was, but he had passed away many, many years Got before it. I, uh, so I never met him, but no, I, in, in my immediate family, it's just me. So wow. I know that uh, maybe I'm the idiot, right? Everybody oh. else is doing other stuff. But again, I, I, I love what I do. I do. That's so wonderful to love what you do is, you know, such an underrated blessing to have that in your life, to love what yeah. you do. And uh, yeah. it's, it's great that you do. And it's great that you do what you're doing. Um, you know, your title is fascinating. You know, I get to interview so many cool and wonderful people like you over the last 17 years in, in, in this spot at, on this podcast. And the titles have shifted around when it comes to sustainability and ESG yeah. and um, impact, you know, executive vice president, general counsel. We sort of know what that means in terms of um, the law and everything. Then sec- and secretary and world of care executive sponsor. So in that title, talk a little bit about your day to day, week to week, month to month duties and how mm-hmm. how you how your days look and how your months look um, for our listeners. Just so they get a little feel of of how yeah. you go about your 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 your, uh, your career. Absolutely. So, you know, I mentioned before, we have 200,000 colleagues around the world. Our legal team is working in about a dozen offices around the world, supporting transactions, operations, just everything that Hyatt does. And so uh, my my main role is as the, the head of the department, the, you know, the, the chief legal officer, yeah. and that involves compliance. So, you know, our team oversees our compliance programs. Uh, but, you know, it's it's we we have a team, a department in within our legal department within Hyatt sure. that really, to me, is sort of like a boutique law firm. We have these areas of expertise, incredibly talented people that um, have come to Hyatt, stayed at Hyatt for what Hyatt is, which is a purpose driven organization. And that's a really important piece of all of this, of, of what we do and why I'm, I'm still here after 20 years and why we have such great retention in our department. Um, so, you know, that also captures, we say secretary is corporate secretary, and that's the governance piece because hi, it's a public company. So that, that's, that picks up that. And then there's world of care. And when we were looking at our, our e, e, when we were thinking about ESG right. some years ago, you know, we, we, Hyatt has been in operation for almost seven decades and we now operate in, I think the current count is 76 countries around the world per our last queue. Oh. And so, you know, we've been, ha- we've, we've been having an impact in communities for a very long time and hotels are their own sort of mini cities sometimes within a city, you know, they have a real presence, a uh, huge, huge, huge colleague employee base. And so, We've been, we'd had fantastic corporate social responsibility programs for a very long time, you know, really focusing on thriving destinations. That's what this is all about. This is a travel, we were a travel company. We're supporting travel and we want to do it in a way that's sustainable for people and, you know, in the destinations in which our hotels operate. And so we've been, we've been leaning into that for a really long time. So when we thought about ESG, we took a look at, you know, well, who are we? What is our, what's our culture? What's our purpose? 
where do we make a difference? And so that's when I had an opportunity to step in as an executive sponsor for World of Care. Uh, and it was, you know, unexpected at the time. But when you when you think about what a lot of department companies are doing, uh, ESG sometimes does sit under the chief legal officer. Sometimes it sits in other areas of the company. I think for us, it was really just it made sense at the time. You know, uh, I'd had a long background overseeing people in international offices. I'm, I'm like, I'm all in on purpose. You know, it's like people joke with the phrase, drink the Kool-Aid. I drink the Kool-Aid. I mix the Kool-Aid. I'll pour you the Kool-Aid. Like I believe it. Um, that's why I'm here. And so it's, it was a golden opportunity for me to, um, to expand into di really different kind of work. And there's a lot to learn in the space, you know, we'll talk about, I'm sure, but it's, it's, it's daunting. The challenges are daunting. The amount of work we do is daunting, but the payoff is, you know, priceless. Let's talk a little bit about that. The World of Care platform, you know, when I did the, some reading material on uh, before we had this wonderful interview, um, World of Care platform, caring for the planet, caring for the people and caring for responsible business. Right. Now, that's those are three wonderful pillars. Break them down a little bit now under each of them and explain what they mean to Hyatt, each each pillar and why they're yeah. all important. Yeah. Well, you know, it starts again with our purpose and our purpose right. is to care for people so they can be their best. So care is at the core Got of it. how we think about really all of the work that we do, how we reach out to guests and customers, you know, how we engage in our communities. And it is the, the DNA that's at the heart of World of Care. Uh, we happen to have a commercial, more of a commercial-based loyalty program called World of Hyatt. So we, we, we thought about our purpose uh, of care, which is, you know, the culture that Hyatt has lived for decades. And we, we thought about world of, uh, world of Hyatt as our passionate loyalty program. And that's where the language around world of care came from. And, and so that really, when we landed on that, I was like, that's it. That's perfect. That's, that's who we are. So the three pillars, caring for people, caring for responsible business, caring for uh, the planet, if you follow ESG, it's a similar framework to ESG, but we were pretty deliberate about not wanting to get hung up on, is it ESG? Is ESG good? Is ESG bad? You know, you do this so in the, in the conversations you have with people on any given days, it feels like you can get some really strong opinions one way or the other about the good, bad, or ugly of ESG, right? No, no need to get caught up in the politics or the polarization of terminology when we're right. all looking for the same impacts. That's exactly right. And so for us, world of care is, it's just who we are. It's the work that we do every day. It's the, the, the hearts and minds of our colleagues, you know, delivering purpose. And at the heart of that is empathy. Like you can't really deliver care right. if you don't understand people. And so there's a very big difference in hospitality between service and care. Getting good service is one thing, but getting being cared for feels yep. a lot different. And that's what has people coming back to our hotels, by the way. So we using empathy, empathy, you know, it's is kind of how we problem solve as well. We went out and we went to our stakeholders and we, we did some, we asked a lot of questions about, well, are we, is our work, are we working in the right places today? Uh, is there anything where, is there a place, where, some aspect of our work that should be different um, or we're not showing up strongly enough? And what came back to us is we're the work that is done by all these colleagues around the world in so many aspects of of world of care. Um, you know, it, it resonated well for us that they would fall into those three pillars. And so, caring for the planet, we have science based targets. We have twenty thirty goals. Uh, we had twenty twenty goals, which when you know we met them and moved on to the right. next. So we're we are thinking broad broad based about what those goals are and we're public about them. And then we have operating regions within the company. Again, it's a large geographic footprint and each operating region, it, you know, has, has the responsibility to action our goals, you know, and it's my oh. job to, to try to help them bring it all together. So you can, you know, report up at a global level, sure. but, you know, so we, we look at that in a multifaceted way. When I think about caring for people, you know, 
uh, inclusion is the heart of hospitality, you know, that people feel welcome when they come into one of our properties, that our colleagues feel like they belong there. You know, that's, that is really important to us. It's also kind of second nature to us. It's not all that hard for us to figure that out. Um, but we, you know, so we, we think about it in terms of, um, you know, well-being, inclusion, DE&I, our benefits programs, things that are uniquely important to hospitality, like human trafficking and human rights. And so we've spent a lot of time um, on all of those topics. So that kind of falls within, that's an example of what's under caring for people and then caring for responsible business. You know, I joined Hyatt 20 years ago because it had a reputation in the Chicago business community sure. of having a great, you know, a business that runs on integrity. First of all, you know, a lawyer, especially like you, you're not going anywhere shady. You want to work for someone, but really like a company that really um, holds itself accountable and does business in a certain way that really resonated with me and with great, like you said, an iconic brand and innovative product, you know, innovative hotels and hotel design. And so it's, it's kind of, it kind of should go without saying that responsible business is the core of everything that we do, but it, you know, we want to be explicit about it. So that's, that's the caring for responsible business piece and and yeah. how we partner with others around that uh, and yeah. the governance we have around all of this. So that's a, that's the high level, although I, I'm, I can, ha I'm happy to dive into any little piece of it. No, let's talk a little bit. I'm fascinated because, you know, what I've seen of most recent times, you know, you have already very important titles that as standalone titles, you could have had an amazing career at Hyatt just being the general counsel of a 200,000 person company. Yeah, it's a great years. job, right? right? It's a <laughs> great it. job itself. But then yeah. you go on secretary and for a little extra, you know, for a cherry on top, World of Care executive sponsor. Talk a little bit about the 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 the, the greatness of cross pollination and mm. cross infer in how I assume, but I, I don't want to assume anything. How does you being general counsel better inform you to be a better executive sponsor of World of Care and vice versa? How does your World of Care executive sponsor work make you a better general counsel of Hyatt? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, you know, I, I there is a compliance element to the reporting right. side, right? In, in sustainability and social, um, sure. social environmental sustainability and social sustainability. So yep. there's a natural fit there in terms of how do, how are we going to report out on what we're doing, doing it with integrity, you know, integrity and so forth and transparency and right. accuracy of data, you know, so that's, that's kind of an easy fit maybe for someone with a legal background. Right. Uh, and there are, it, it's getting hard to keep up actually with the number of local regulations for across the US, well, across the globe. That's right? what I was going to ask you. How hard is that? 76 countries and all, <laughs> and all the, uh, let's just call it a patchwork quilt of regulations yeah. now that are that are governing all these very, very, you know, newish type of, yeah. uh, you, know, uh, regu you know, newish laws, newish regulations. And they're all over the place when it comes to the EU versus US and what yeah. Gensler is doing at the SEC and then and then what's going to happen in Asia. Is there going to be, you know, what do you foresee right now? How difficult is it? And do you foresee a more harmonized future when it comes to these regulations? Uh, it's difficult. Uh, so, yes, how difficult is it? It's difficult. Uh, it's hard. It is hard. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you, you have to figure out, okay, well, there are all these different regulations, which of them apply to, to right. your business, depending right. on your footprint, your revenue, where you have operations and so forth. So there's all of that analysis. And then, um, you know, just there, there isn't a real consistency across mm -hmm. geographies. There aren't mm -hmm. even, there isn't even real consistency across the States in the United right. States. And that's right. one one country. Um, right. And so we're waiting on the SEC and, you know, we'll see what comes from that. Um, but we are there are some like in the EU CSRD uh, and there are reporting obligations around that for uh, related to that. That is more comprehensive. That is across the span of ESG. And in other countries, it's there's there's more. The expectations are growing. So for us, you know. Uh, there's there's some there's some pull throughs in terms of the data across jurisdictions, and I think if we 
are clear in our strategy about what our goals are and how we're going to report against them, that's the starting point. So that's what we did with World of Care. We, we said, okay, we've got 20, 30 goals and we have goals with respect to DE&I that were really important to us, especially in the last few years. And we're public about them and we're public about our, our progress against those goals. Um, we've all, So we're already down the pathway of ensuring that we have good data in order to you know, make make all of that information public. We want to be careful about that. So right. Any company should, public company especially. Um, and we don't want to mislead people. We wanted to, we want people to really understand the work that we're doing. But getting around, getting our arms around the changing regulations, uh, it's it's there are a lot more lawyers doing ESG for a reason. And right. that's part of it, right? Because you, we're trying to understand um the implications of all of the laws. Will there be a like one no, <laughs> I don't think it's right. going to happen. Right. I mean, there, you know, but um, I'm hoping even in just in the United States, we land on whatever it's going to look like, maybe driven by the SEC. And then another, you know, the EU will have its own and certain regions will have their own. There are enough consistencies across them, though, that guide us in how we think about what we're going to be planning for in the coming two, three, four years and when it comes to reporting. Hope that helps. It's not really much of an answer because it's a, it's it's kind of a mess. It yeah, is no, out there. No, it is an answer because, like you just said, I mean, there's the, there's um a lot of wisdom for the for the for the from the C suite for making you um the general counsel, then also a world of care executive sponsor. Given, like you said, the 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 patchwork quilt of all the regulations across the planet is who's going to manage? I mean, that's yeah, that would be very hard. For a person who is "quote unquote" a layman, maybe an environmental scientist, but a, a legal layman to a lay person to navigate all that, just yeah. it sounds like it would be beyond daunting. Yeah, it, it's it's hard work. Um, I will say though, again, it's joyful work. But the the le- legal team and me and my role, we see a lot across the company, right? And I think that helps in terms of how we think about. This, the story, you helping our team, we have, yeah. first of all, we have a wonderful communications team that we work with on, on World of Care reporting. We have an incredible head of sustainability. We have a credible head of um, CSR. I'm in on a steer co with our CFO and our CHRO, and we collectively, you know, lean into how we bring World of Care to life and, and provide, you know, s- setting the strategy for how we're talking about it and what we're focusing on. Right. Uh, so it's it's certainly not me alone by any stretch of the imagination, oh. but I do have visibility across the organization that gives me an opportunity, you know, to pull, exactly. pull the threads together, if you will. For our listeners and viewers who've just joined us, we've got Margaret Egan with us today. She's the Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and secretary and World of Care executive sponsor at Hyatt Hotels Corporation to find Margaret and her colleagues and all the important work they're doing in sustainability and at World of Care. Please go to www.hyatt.com backslash World of Care. Margaret, talk a little bit about, as a whole, the macro hospitality industry. What are the, if you were to say, what are the top two or three common challenges that the hospitality industry has uh, when it comes to sustainability and how is Hyatt going about uh, facing those top two or three challenges? Well, it's a great question. You know, I think the first thing is the buildings, you know, many hotels, some we're building hotel owners are building new hotels all the time and, and more and more with sustainability in mind, but there are hundreds of thousands of hotels around the world that are longstanding buildings. And so like any homeowner, you know, uh, how do you, how do you manage the energy consumption in your house and so forth? But these are, these are businesses living in buildings and the, the nature of our work is to serve big groups, have people come in and out all the time, you know? And so we have this industry that provided single use plastics, for instance, uh, you know, and people love them. They take them home. You love the shampoo. Oh, I love going to this particular brand. Right. The shampoo smells really good. I take it home. Mm-hmm. And so we've had to move away from things like that to, um, you know, multiple use, uh, you know, toiletries. Like you can't take them home anymore. Uh, so 
that's a, it's a silly, it seems like a silly thing, but sometimes you go to hotels seeking luxury or you want to get that little toiletry and take it or the pen, you know, the pen or the pencil or the notepad or something. And we've re we're removing all of those things because they're not sustainable and we don't want to be contributing to a landfill filled with little plastic shampoos and, and that's, so right. that's, that's right. an operational issue. Sure. Then you have buildings. The buildings have been in existence for decades and you can't retrofit them. Mm. Now, I would say our hotel teams are unbelievably creative in terms of figuring out how to reduce energy usage or invest in renewable energy or other like so we have hotels with um, solar panels on them. We have hotels with their own water filtration plants to help manage you know water. We have hotels that focus all of them try to focus on food waste. Some have really you know innovative ways of, of doing that. So. There's there's a ton of passion at the hotel level, um, and there's a challenge in bringing it all together into a, a framework that also achieves our corporate goals, like driving in, in a larger way on our science based targets and our reduction of waste and our reduction, you know, um, of energy usage and so forth. Um, but I would say, like, it's the buildings. And it's the experience that guests expect to have in the buildings, you know, um, that luxury, right. not all of them are luxury. I know that, but, you know, and you have cleaning and the cleaning happens every day and they're using cleaning products. Like it's, it's a business model that requires turnover. That's the, right. that's the point of it. You come for a night and you leave. And there are, there's work in order to support that, that is challenging to think differently about when you're considering sustainability. But um, it's one that's very much on our minds. And I, and you know, I know other hotel companies as well. We have a, an industry association, America's hotel and lodging association, and they're really taking some leadership around uh, sustainability and bringing the hotel companies together to support, you know, broader actions. And, and we're part of that. We're, we're a founding member of that, you know, so we, we want to, we want to stay close to the solution, even while it's, we know it's daunting in the meantime. You know, Margaret, I'm a big fan of your hotels. I've stayed at them across the whole planet. Uh, What's your favorite the, one? Probably, which is the one I'm about to bring up. In 1993, I started going to Hong Kong. For the oh. first, you know, and and I know you have a Grand Hyatt Hong Kong, which I've stayed at in the last, in the, you know, in, in recent years. And um, and when I was reading up before our interview today, I read, talk a little bit about the the, the fascinating win you got there with regards to the room keys. Yeah, so Grand Hyatt Hong Kong, which is a beautiful hotel, oh, oh. so just really gorgeous Luxury. hotel, uh, and wonderful, warm people who work there, like yep. really caring for you when you're there. They're just yep. wonderful. So yeah, they um, they replaced the, the plastic room keys, which you know, some you get a room key and maybe you remember to bring it back to the front desk, or maybe you don't, and you find it in your luggage the next week, and they they cycle through. They replace them with sustainable uh, materials so that it's no they're no longer plastic room keys. You know, and we we have um, you know apps and so forth that we that people can use to come in and out of their rooms as well, and that's not doesn't work for everybody. But um, at the Grand Hyatt Hong Kong, yeah, they they came up with a way to replace the room key with a sustainable product that um, is, is terrific. I mean, and that's kind of interesting because a room key is is embedded sort of digital tool, if you will, right? Sure. And so they figured that out, which is really cool. Do you think that's going to become more of a, of a bigger trend in the hospitality industry as a whole? I do think so. Um, yes, I think we're all looking for ways to to make make inroads, you know, and that's anything you kind of you focus on the things that that uh, cycle through more quickly than others. Room keys are one of them. Toiletries, like I mentioned before, you know, things like that. Yeah, no, I think it's I think that you'll see more and more of that over time. And therefore, they'll the products will become less expensive over time as well, I think. You know, you we, you were talking about the importance uh, at Hyatt uh, in DIE, uh, you know, and yeah. and, and uh, yeah. you, you have you you Hyatt joined the Tent Partnership for Refugees uh, program. Can you share a little bit about what that is? Yeah, we're one of about uh, 250 companies that joined this program uh, to support refugees, and I think since we've joined we've hired 500 of them uh, because we we really focus our our sort of CSR philanthropy on education and job tra job training for opportunity individuals and so the 
the tent partnership is is a, an example of that. We also have uh, Rise High, which is a signature program that supports again tr training opportunities for people in um, search circumstances where they don't otherwise have good job training. So we've committed to also hiring out of you know a certain number out of the Rise High program. I think we just uh, celebrated our ten year anniversary of Rise High. Uh, I think we have hired uh, five years, sorry, five year, five year anniversary. I get my numbers right. Um, and we've hired 5,300 people out of that program. So, you know, that's, and we just love that. And that's all over the world because that really, you could see how that could make a difference in communities around the world. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's really, we know that you can have an amazing career starting in hospitality. We have like leaders all oh. over the organization who started as, you know, front or first first time entry level positions at hotels that we're able to move up. Uh, so that's what we're all about. I'm going to make the argument, Margaret, that I think hospitality as a career and as a transferable skill is one of the greatest skills anyone can have, no matter what they end up evolving into or whatever career path their career takes them on. But learning up front in terms of the hospitality industry, I think it's one of the most, if not the most transferable skill, because it's, at the end of the day, like you said, it's about empathy and it's yeah. about passion and it's about people. That's that's exactly right. And if you act, if you're really good at it, you exercise empathy well, you yeah. learn that skill. That's a that's a muscle, you know, that you have that that you take that anywhere, anywhere. you know, anywhere. anywhere. Uh, my boss always says he has two ears and one mouth. Use them in proportion. <laughs> so what? listen twice as much, twice as much as you talk. But that's a that's a sort of joke sure. around empathy. But it's true. It's really but, true. Listening. And and I really think nowadays with what technology has done to us and made us more isolated somewhat and made us more separate. Even though we're connecting over technology today, in many yeah. ways. Um, technology has isolated us more and and sort of um, depersonalized our personalized skills, which are so important. Hospitality, yeah. nothing nothing beats having great empathy skills and great hospitality skills. Nothing. You're 100 percent correct. And in, in thinking about the technology side of it, you know, when when the pandemic hit and the hospitality was hit was really um, the, we, we it was very different times in, in early 2020. We. We came to understand very early on that people still wanted to travel and experience. You know, they they want well, they want to get out there. They want to see the world. They want to be with people. They want to experience things. And so there's a resilience to the industry as well. And it's, there's a resilience to the people who are in the industry that I think is really um, inspiring. Back to DEI and the importance yeah. of DEI. Um, in spirit mentoring. You're a woman who's in a very powerful and big time leadership position. Mm -hmm. in Hyatt. Talk a little bit about your in-spirit mentoring program at Hyatt. Yeah, it's a program based uh, out of our EMI team. So that's Europe, Africa, Middle East team. Right. And it, it, they have uh, about 170 mentee, mentor mentees in this program over 18 countries in Europe. And it's really around, you know, providing the mentorship, career mentorship for people, you know, and sometimes it's... Um, You'll have folks who have so much talent and so much opportunity, right? So much in front of them, but they they need they need a little bit more. They need a little bit more, you know, support, mentorship, guidance that they might not have somewhere else in their life. And it's been a fabulous program, actually, uh, that the that our team launched. It's really worked out well. One thing I want to bring up is the uh, I, I, something an, an issue. I'm 61 years old, and an issue that I really wasn't familiar with at all until this summer when a movie came out, a movie called Sound of Freedom. Mm -hmm. And um, it was about human trafficking. Very, yeah. very um, fascinating and important movie. It made a big impact on my life and my family's life. Um, talk a little bit about Hyatt's approach, the zero tolerance approach to human trafficking um, as, a, as a reflection of their commitment to human rights. Yeah, it's it, zero tolerance. So yeah. every single employee at Hyatt takes human trafficking training to be on on the lookout for the signs of human trafficking. Right. So I take it. Uh, everyone on my team um, takes it because I don't work in a hotel, but I go to hotels. And so the idea um, is that if you if you see something amiss, act on it. And you know, it it really it's a real thing out in the world, human trafficking. And so we we decided that we and and I will say the other hotel companies have have filed suit over the years, and we're all similarly aligned around uh, doing everything we can 
to educate our colleagues on this and stop it wherever we can. So uh, our CFO, Joan Botterini, is uh, co-chair of the No Room for Trafficking Advisory Council with HLA, the organization I mentioned before. Great. We have this training program that we've developed in partnership with um, advisory groups to ensure that we're really, it's it's great training. And, and it's made a difference. We have stories that are, uh, oh God, they're so heart-wrenching um, but and amazing from hotel teams saying, because I took the training, I saw something mm. that I wasn't sure about and I did something about it. And, you know, thankfully in our hotels, it's it's not a super common occurrence, but it's it's a thing that's out there. And we just, we really, we're, again, no tolerance, zero tolerance. We have to take the world as it is and not as we want it to be. It's and therefore we've got to deal with the issues as they, as they come across and, exactly and right. make sense that and it's, but that's a, that's a real, that's a real win when your employees are yeah. able to observe and recognize what's going on because of your training and then take action. Those are lives that are saved. Those Absolutely. Are, that's, 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 that's exactly it. That's it. Those are lives that are saved. You know, Margaret, I've got to ask you, you, you sit in a fascinating position, not only visibility um, at Hyatt in 76 countries with, with such a diverse workforce um, across so many different regions and geographies. Talk a little bit about the challenge of going to bed at night and waking up in the morning and understanding and uh, are, you know, are we doing enough? How do you benchmark Hyatt? both internally and externally against your competitors and even against other great iconic brands that um, are similarly situated in terms of geography and in terms of size. Yeah. What do you use as benchmarks to, to understand, are you doing enough on this journey? Are you do, can you do more? How does that work? Because we all know that sustainability, there's no finish line and that the, the journey is ongoing always, but how do you balance the, you know, and celebrate the wins, but try to figure out who's doing other things better that you could aspire to? Well, inspiration is important and, or, and aspirations are important, sure. you know, and so looking around, we do look around to see what possibilities are out there, you know, how, how, what kind of creative solutions are out there. Sure. I don't necessarily spend a lot of time thinking about how our work stacks up against our competition. Okay. I mean, it's the competition is out there. Sure. But, you know, World of Care was designed empathy first with thinking about what our stakeholders want, what our colleagues are looking for, what our investors are looking for, the owners of our hotels who are incredible partners with us in all of this work. You know, um, what what should we be doing? And so sure. that's that's my, and, 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 and does what we do comport with our purpose of care. And that's the North Star. I, we say that all the time here. That's the North Star. That guides the strategy in world of care and outside world of care in our business strategy and you know how we reach our guests and customers and so forth. So if we're living in a manner, if we're operating in a manner consistent with our purpose and our colleagues, and we ask for feedback, we we really, we we want feedback from our colleagues. If they're giving us the feedback that we're on the right path that and they support it, then I feel good about that. Then I don't wake up in the middle of the night worried about what, you know, a certain other company may be doing here, there, the, or anywhere. Um, but it, yeah, no, it, it, that's one of the most exciting things about World of Care for me mm. is the passion that we've seen come through our colleagues. Like they latched on to World of Care, like they get it. Like, this is our language. This is who we are. This is our culture and history. And so they are all about it, you know, and, and I get notes all the time from somebody who is do, working on something, whether it's sustainability or something else within the world of care kind of kind of uh, framework. And they come back and they're, they're just like, it's made their lives different. You know, they they I feel they feel good about what they're doing. I, w I want everyone to who works here to love where they work as much as I love where I work. And I, that's what, that's what I'm about. So Hello. yes, benchmarking matters. Um, and all, you know, stakeholders have different opinions too. Investor groups have different opinions and owner hotel owners have different right. opinions, right. but we're about listening and figuring out, getting, getting that, that, 
that right spot for us. That's Change Starts Here, which is a you know signature DEI platform, which we didn't talk about yet. We set that up in 2020 when you know we thought about the murder of George Floyd. We thought about all these things that were happening, and we said we've got great DEI policies, and we've got um, we have great training, and we're good people. Why are we not? making enough of a difference here. We need to do things a little bit differently. So we challenge ourselves from time to time and say, our hearts are in the right place. Our heads are in the right place. And yet we're not, we're, we're not making meaningful, meaningful enough, um, you know, steps toward where we want to be. So that's when we, that's when we say, okay, stake in the ground. Let's think about this a little bit differently, get our colleague feedback and listen and apply those learnings and, and go forward. You know, Margaret, uh, you've had 20 years at Hyatt, and you're still very relatively young. As the <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're my favorite person today. <laughs> well, it's true. It's true. So what gets you excited about uh, the future, what that you're allowed to talk about? What's 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 exciting about uh, the upcoming year ahead for yeah. what your what your initiatives are and Hyatt's initiatives are uh, that, that really gets you really pumped up? Well, uh, we learned a lot of things about how we work during the pandemic, right? When 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 there's true emergency on you all the time, every minute, existential levels of emergency, <laughs> you, you work differently, you know, you collaborate differently and so forth. And so we came to realize that we had opportunity to expand that experience and agile agility, agile ways of working to work differently, you know, to understand the mindsets that we're bringing to the work every day and how we could think differently, work differently, lead differently. And so I am incredibly excited, like super jazzed about this next phase of Hyatt's history because it were a revolution, I should say, because, um, I think we're, we're challenging ourselves to blow up the old ways of working and, and just, you know, come at things differently. Like somebody said to me the other day, you know, the old adage of it's not always the work that you do, it's how you do it. And mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about right now. And for us, it's all in the service of others. It's all about advancing care. So for the way we work is intended to advance care to you. If you're staying at the Grand Hyatt, you know, in Hong Kong or somebody else to our colleagues and so forth. So I think, um, I'm excited about the work. We all are, we talk, we're talking a lot about it here at Hyatt. We think it's uh, an amazing unlock for us, and um, there's just great opportunity ahead around it. So I, I won't get into all the details, but no. it's, it's really uh, it's fun. It's fun, invigorating work. Well, the fun thing for me is that sustainability has, has no finish line. So it's yes. going to be a continued journey that you're on at Hyatt. <laughs> And I ask you, and you're welcome to always come back on the Impact Podcast and share the continued successes that you have and journey that yeah. you're on with your colleagues at Hyatt. And Margaret, I just want to thank you for your time today and just uh, wish you continued success. For anyone who wants to find Margaret Egan and her colleagues at Hyatt Hotels and all the impactful and important work that they're doing, please go to www.hyatt.com backslash world of care. Margaret Egan. Thank you for being on the Impact Podcast today. And more importantly, thank you and your colleagues at Hyatt for making the world a better place. Ah, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful op uh, opportunity for me. I love the conversation. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. <laughs>